workshop is sponsored by the Charles Carroll Program, and I would like to take just a moment to say a little bit more about the Carroll Program and how this event fits into our vision. So the program is going on its sixth year now, and we see ourselves as contributing to campus discussion about pressing issues in contemporary American politics. We're named after the only Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence, and part of why we are is to signal, signal our interest in long-standing long issues in American life, and in speaking to issues that are of unique interest to students at a Catholic college. One of the things we do uh, as a program is we bring in very talented young political scientists as Carroll postdoctoral fellows to teach in Montserrat and in the political science department. Uh, and another thing we do is to select very talented undergraduates to join our Carroll Fellows program. They take a seminar and they have some opportunities to do some research uh, or summer internship and internships and they get to participate in events like this. And over the past couple of years, we've had uh, workshops, seminars on capitalism and seminars on technology and politics. So we have students from both of those uh, experiences here uh, who can share some of their, their background. Our mission requires us to think about issues that challenge us as well as to maintain and think about the kind of values that Charles Carroll and the, and the Declaration express. I personally think that the, that the digital age poses a number of challenges uh, to some of these values, particularly to the Declaration's assertion of an individualistic worldview uh, and of political life. And I'm not sure that we engage these issues sufficiently on campus. Sometimes I fear that we can have a kind of reactionary attitude towards technology, a kind of sense that technology is not something that is fitting in with the liberal arts environment, that liberal arts should resist technological advance in favor of reflection and tradition. And that's why I'm so excited that we can spend some time today talking with Yohai Binkler, a uh, scholar with a very sophisticated understanding of the technical aspects of the internet and a soulful understanding of how humans interact with their technology. Professor Binkler is Berkman Professor of Entrepreneurial Legal Studies at Harvard Law School and faculty co-director of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. If you're interested in these issues, I encourage you to go to their website and look at some of their recorded events, which are really fantastic. Uh, he received his Bachelor of Laws from Tel Aviv University and his JD from Harvard Law School. Before that, he taught at, or before uh, coming to Harvard, he taught at New York University School of Law and Yale Law School. Before that, he was a law clerk to Justice Stephen Breyer and associate at the Ropes and Gray Law Firm in Boston. His work has been widely praised. His 2006 book, The Wealth of Networks, How Social Production Transforms Markets and Freedom won the American Political Science Association's Don K. Price Award for the best book on science, technology, and politics. Um, and the American Sociological Association's Section on Communication and Information Technologies Book Award. It's a tremendous book, and I encourage anyone interested in thinking about these things to get a little bit uh, deeper into the book. In 2007, he received the Electronic Frontier Foundation's Pioneer Award, an annual prize for people and organizations who have made significant contributions to the empowerment of individuals in using computers. And just to put that in perspective, the year before uh, the winner of that award was Craigslist and uh, uh, the Whales. So, uh, and in 2011, he received the Ford Foundation Social Change Visionaries Award. Most recently, in 2011, he published The Penguin and the Leviathan, How Cooperation Triumphs Over Self-Interest, which delves more deeply into questions about the biological, economic, and social bases for human cooperation online and on. I could say a lot more, but instead, let's just get straight to Professor Mayer. Thank you. Before we do that, do you want oh, to no, no, go we ahead. We said we just asked people to introduce themselves. I just wanted to say such a nice introduction. Who, who is here? I have to say thank you first of all. All right. All right. Um, so, you're right. Let's, let's Bill, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I'm Bill Clark in the Religious Studies Department. Uh, Carly Harold, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Political Science Department with the Carroll Center. I'm also a postdoctoral fellow uh, with the Carroll program. Uh, my name is Alex Duff, uh, and I'm just starting here this year. Very glad to be here. Barbara Craig in the theater department. Neil Smith, classics. Uh, Jacqueline Basha, I'm a English major, rising junior. Mary Roach from the religious studies department. I'm Sarah Stanbury from the English department. I'm Marius Zardis. I'm a computer science major, senior. Tim Rice, political science major, I'm senior. I'm Aaron Harold of the Political Science Department. Um, I'm Eric Trees, I'm a junior and I'm a biology major. And uh, Jenny? Uh, anyway. Hi, oh. I'm Jenny German Moles, I'm in Sociology and Anthropology. And Ellen Cohen, the Chief Information Officer, Head of IT. Uh, I'm Harold Knapp, I'm the Network Operations Director. 
Denise Shea for Political Science Department and one of the Associate Deans. Lynn Kramer, Theater Department, Arts Transcending Borders. Um, Jennifer Casey, uh, Sophomore History from Dublin. Uh, Katie McCurden, Accounting Major and Studio, studio Art Minor. And Professor Veloci in Political Science. Um, Anthony Cristatello, Biology Major. And Jesse Anderson and I had the AV group for IT. So it's a great pleasure to be here and to uh, have the opportunity to have a conversation with you about ways of thinking about things I've been thinking about for 20 years in the context of the current much deeper recognition of the um, uh, depth of economic inequality, particularly in the United States and the UK, to some extent in other advanced countries and the relationship between what we have uh, been looking very internally in the internet and technology space on the role of the commons and connecting it to uh, trends of thoughts and political movement outside. Um, and this is something that I'm spending a lot of time on now and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, um, uh, I'm, I've been asked to speak for about an hour and then we can have an hour and a half or so of conversation around that and the other things that you're, that, that you're raising. Uh, this is not a technology talk. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's, it's much more about um, our ideas and how they frame how we are with and to each other than it is about technology. These are by now very familiar images of the shape of economic inequality in the United States, uh, and in this case on the bottom in several other Anglophone countries. Um, and the core story, this particular one has to do with the share of the top decile of income. The particular uh, story is one in which we saw from the uh, 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 1930s, late 30s to, to the World War II, on until the late 70s, early 80s, a compression of income inequality. And we have seen a steady separation between the income to the very top of the income distribution and uh, the income <coughs> of the rest of the distribution. And this, is a, uh, and this is a characteristic typical of the United States in particular, very powerful in the UK as well, to some extent in, in other uh, major um, 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 Anglophone, let's call it that, although Can Canadians would disagree yeah. with that characterization, countries as well. Um, it's important to recognize that this move combines two very distinct forces. The first is a stagnation of wages at the median. So what you see here is that from 1948 to 1973, productivity growth and real wage, median wage growth rose at the same rate. And what you see is that from particularly the late 70s, these two have separated, real median wages have more or less stagnated while productivity growth uh, continued. So something there happened to separate the capacity of median workers to receive the same proportion of increase uh, as they had before. The second move is the separation of the very, very top uh, 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 from everybody else. So this is the top 1%, saw a 240% increase in, uh, 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 in income from 79 to 2007. Even the 95th to 99th saw only 71 rather than 240. And when you start to look at the middle fifth, you're down to 19 or 10% for the lower fifth. So there's these two distinct motions, the stagnation in the middle and the super uh, uh, explosion at the top. This is another way of looking at the same thing with regard to how much of an in annual increase uh, each of the uh, uh, bottom fifth, second fifth, middle fifth saw from 47 to 79 versus from 79 to today. <clears throat> so it's, clear, it's very clear, very distinct. It's happening at the tippy top, and it's happening in the medium. And these are two quite distinct phenomena, though I will suggest to you they are tied to a set of ideas that then translate into a variety of uh, uh, models. 
even within, if we, if we try to uh, dig into one, even within the top 1%, what we see is that if you could, again, here we are at 1940, 1970, you see that 90 to 95 and 95 to 99 are fairly stable since the 70s. These are these two lines uh, that are lighter colored. It's the top 1% that has seen the massive increase. So again, we're not talking about something like Gini coefficient where you're comparing uh, uh, quintiles. We're talking about a single percent extracting a major portion. And the last piece of information that will allow us to begin to connect these two ideas is that the major proportion of income comes from uh, um, labor income, as it were, not capital income. This is not aggregation of wealth receiving returns. This is a particular distribution of return from work income. Only when you get to the top 0.1% do you get to a point where returns from existing wealth are more important than returns from work. So where does this work return come from? It essentially comes from the incentives theory, from agency theory, from shareholder value, from a set of theories about how to become efficient and productive that translate into the stock option model of reward for CEOs and sets an entirely new set of norms about what appropriate compensation is and what counts as appropriate return to different levels of contribution. The second major component, in addition to uh, uh, returns at the very top, that goes uh, uh, to uh, uh, that, that falls out of shareholder value, and we'll talk about that in a minute, is the rise of contingent or alternative work arrangements. So as, and I'm not going to talk about all of the details for why it is that we saw this separation. As uh, uh, economists have tried to separate out different components of what went into the middle weakening, one of the components was uh, deunionization, which goes to bargaining power. Another was the increasing share of contingent work uh, and temp work. And the reason that I put it on the table today is technological, because this seems to be the primary fear, and I'll tie it together later on with the commons and peer production. The primary fear with the on-demand economy is that we will take a phenomenon that began in the 1960s with Kelly Girls and a variety of other changes of the temp economy and has grown over time through a certain conceptual shift in the idea of the relationship between the firm and the workers. Workers being a commodity flow in and out that you can just absorb, that, that you have the temp agency or the worker absorbing uh, the risk of business cycle as opposed to that there's a long-term relationship between the firm and uh, the workers. But this, and, and this is from a GAO report, from, from a general accountability office, uh, a government accountability office uh, report that suggests that once you add uh, core contingent workers and various people in alternative work arrangements, part-time, uh, uh, self-employed, etc., you get to something around 40% of the workforce at the high end Although core contingent, you're talking about about 8%. It's a substantial portion of people. This is all US economy. So let's keep this here because we'll come back to it. The other thing you can see from the OECD report here is that this is not unique to the United States, that increases in part-time contingent work arrangements are occurring across OECD countries. And what's systematically the case is that Gini coefficient of income is higher when you include temp workers than not. That is to say, temp workers are systematically earning less than full-time workers. We're not talking about a situation where people entrepreneurially go as consultants and make a lot of money, though there are such stories. What we're talking systematically on an economy-wide basis is more people flowing in and out of the workforce, seeing their income volatile over the course of the year and overall making less. And this is true not only in the United States, it's true even in social democracies in Europe, though there's a good bit of difference between how much of this is voluntary to the extent that you accept voluntariness uh, given various uh, uh, social constraints. 
That's a lot of background. And now we're beginning to talk about ideas. So does anybody use Ingram? Um, it's a very imperfect tool, but it's really cool and interesting. Um, what it does is it, it counts the number of times a word appears over uh, in the corpus of books that's been digitized. And it can tell you look at changes that a word, to the extent a word can change and can identify, changes in general idea flow or, or, or um, a, a sense of what it is that's common to talk about in books. So it always is also a few years time lag because book take, take, books take time. Um, once upon a time, in the distant past, the dominant view of work relations in management uh, literature was called the human relations uh, theory. And the idea here was essentially if you had workers that were part of the enterprise, this really comes out of both on one hand labor struggles and on the other hand uh, uh, Ford's re-understanding re of, of the relationship with, uh, with labor. So from the 50s, uh, through the late 70s, human relations was the major view. The point of the corporation had stakeholders, had workers, had consumers, had communities. Uh, let, uh, let's not be overly uh, rosy in our story, but it's stark by comparison to what follows it from perhaps the most famous speech, Jack Welch's speech uh, at GE, that really begins to raise shareholder value. I have never successfully uh, run a Google Ingram uh, search that has been so stark and so identifiable as to how non-existent the idea of shareholder value was before the late 70s and how dominant it became. And the critical idea behind shareholder value is that CEOs and executives, employees, everybody else is self-interested. In order to get them to work well, self-interested in a material way, in order to get them to work well together, you have to identify a residual material interest holder who will bear all of the upsides and downsides of the inefficiency of an organization. That class of people are the shareholders. So you, as a manager, no longer need to deal with the happiness of the employees, the well-being. You need to focus on shareholder value what will increase the value of the shareholder. This gets translated through a theory called agency theory into the idea that therefore executive compensation needs to be in stock options so that their selfish interests are aligned with the selfish interests of the shareholders that together will lead the company to be the most efficient it can be. And so we see the transition to stock option compensation, which is a central component of the explosion in, um, uh, in, in labor income proportion of the top 1% and the top 0.1%, which in turn creates um, uh, for a society of, of largely social norm conformists like ourselves, new benchmarks for what counts as appropriate salaries at the tippy top and then whatever it leads at the bottom. The critical thing I want you to see here is that these ideas shifting is as expressed in books follow the same time period that we talk about the actual economic outcomes. The other thing that happens is that firms, even non-financial firms, begin to invest more in the stock market and in financial assets as part of their operations. Why? Because it's a more reliable, short-term way of increasing shareholder value. Today, you're seeing it with stock buybacks in particular. So this is, again, the same inflection point around 1980. And this is the share of revenues going to non-financial companies from financial investments. Same inflection point. The critical point I want you to see is the inflection point that is both idea-based and practice-based across wide domains of industry. This is not about a particular decision of a particular company. It is not about a particular law that changes one way or the other. It's a shift that's conceptual. And here, in some sense, is the most radical thing that really amazed me when I, when I uh, uh, followed up on it, which is this is the same Google Ngram idea on the words 
incentives, solidarity, fairness, and rationality. Fairness dominates throughout the 19th century. Solidarity rises between World War I and the late 60s. Incentives really only emerges slowly in the 20s and 30s, but, pipe, but, but peaks as economics becomes both more dominant and more microeconomically uh, focused. And we see it dominating all of the rest with rationality following a very similar path at a lower, uh, at a lower level of intensity. Um, so these are, so shareholder value is a particular application of this much, much deeper uh, shift in the set of ideas that govern how it is that we interpret the world and then manage it and design toward it. Uh, and we see the fossil record in the books of the last uh, uh, 120 years. How does this translate to the chart we saw before? The Great Compression covers administrations that we today and they at the time thought were vastly different from each other ideologically. From the Eisenhower administration straight through the Carter administration, it's all like this. Let's not forget it was Richard Nixon who imposed price controls in the face of early 70s inflation because the idea of raising interest rates and increasing unemployment was simply unacceptable. And at the same time, the increases, as you see, both Reagan-Thatcher period, and here I use Reagan-Thatcher because it's not an American-specific phenomenon. It's a transatlantic neoliberal phenomenon. Uh, both the Reagan-Thatcher period and the Clinton-Blair period, which essentially sees a reincorporation, and I, and I thought of this before Jeremy Corbyn, um, 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 sees a reincorporation. You continue to see the top 1% rising throughout this period. Even though ideologically in the normal politics of the day, these are completely competing views, they are in fact embedded not in ideology in the colloquial sense of politics, but in the ideology in the Gramscian sense of a frame through which one sees the world and everything needs to line. Um, so I'm not saying that the future of capitalism is determined only by this one trajectory. But this is certainly one trajectory along which we can understand the future of advanced capitalist economies is this question of the neoliberal trajectory and how it translates or doesn't translate into, uh, uh, into uh, oligarchy and, cro and crony capitalism. And now a little bit of uh, 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 why, why that is. So if you think of neoliberalism as a set of ideas, first, it's that uncertainty and complexity makes centralized decision making impossible. Too many moving parts disable a rational centralized organization from knowing enough both about the inputs and about the processes to actually come up with a rational outcome. Decentralized decisions in markets, by contrast, by individuals, will continuously sense the state of the world and therefore make better decisions. Universal rationality modeled as self-interested uh, 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 maximizing individuals is not correct descriptively, but it's a better model than anything else we have for trying to understand how people will uh, uh, respond. Collective action fails and corrupts into illegitimate power because once you have universal rationality, self-interest as a model, then the idea of a solidaristic, uh, 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 collective, uh, uh, um, goods-oriented, or public good-oriented uh, uh, administration becomes impossible. Liberty depends on choice in market and planning, therefore, transforms into despotism. The only way for a central planner to make economies work is to simplify them enough so that they operate in a predictable way. The only way to simplify them enough is to destroy people's liberty to do it, whatever it is that they want. This is essentially Hayek Friedman, uh, less than one of them. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Therefore, we have deregulation. We have freeing of markets from political and social controls. 
that is both efficient and liberating, uh, and market incentives are necessary and adequate to explain human behavior in these complex systems. That's the core set of ideas that really falls straight out of Hayek and Friedman that is very much in the wilderness in the 40s and 50s and 60s, and faced with the crisis of hyperinflation in the 70s, connected to Friedman's correct predictions about hyperinflation, becomes an incredibly influential economic theory. But what's important to see is that it's also part of a broader intellectual arc that moves from collective to individualist explanations. This is much more in the uh, Penguin and Leviathan book, the, 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 the story that I tell there. Um, in evolutionary biology, if in the 50s we talk about starlings for, uh, uh, rising in the night as a, group, uh, uh, as a group selection mechanism, by the 60s we move to much more explicit mechanisms that are about self-interest, like kin selection, so that by 76 Dawkins can write the selfish gene. If you look at economics, we've already talked about it. If you look at political theory, Downs, Mansur Olson's Logic of Collective Action, uh, Garrett Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons, these are all models that essentially say central government uh, fails or central organization fails. And the same was true in management science, where Taylorism or uh, a Weberian view of bureaucracy suggests that as society becomes larger and more complex, it is controlled, people do whatever they want, move in all sorts of ways, and therefore we have to control them. Most powerfully, we see it later on in Schumpeter, in, 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 uh, in Williamson, uh, and his transaction cost economics. What makes firms effective is controlling shirking. What we've seen since the 90s, and this is where at long last I will actually get to the internet, what we see in the 90s is uh, in each of these disciplines the reemergence of views of the possibility of cooperation and collective action. In biology, back to we see indirect reciprocity, multi-level selection, gene culture co-evolution. In economics, we see a massive shift towards experimental economics in uh, cooperation and the possibility and, in fact, ubiquity of trust and cooperation. Uh, uh, in political theory, Lynn Ostrom on the commons is the most powerful and important. Um, uh, and in management science, Toyota production system as early as the 80s, and then network uh, uh, management theories, high performance, high commitment, high performance organizations begin to develop as a very strong trend within management science, also reversing this single, reversing the dominance, though not the continued importance of the single idea of shareholder. Nowhere have I seen a clearer description of this transition than this segment from the selfish gene. Be warned that if you wish, as I do, to build a society in which individuals cooperate generously and unselfishly towards a common good, you can expect little help from biological nature. Let us try to teach generosity and altruism because we are born selfish, etc. By 2006, in science, Martin Novak ends a, a theoretical paper with perhaps the most remarkable aspect of evolution is its ability to generate cooperation in a competitive world. Thus, we might add natural cooperation as a third fundamental principle of evolution beside mutation and natural selection. That happened in that field without anyone there deeply believing or being self-conscious about the parallels with these other uh, disciplines. So now we come to commons. And essentially what happened in common study was within political theory, political science, and, and later on economics, <coughs> some anthropology, and some sociology, was the emergence of the Ostrom School of Commons, which very much, Lynn Ostrom um, um, uh, founding the, the, the workshop on political theory at uh, uh, Indiana, um, uh, created a series of case studies and then synthesized them into case study based proof of the success of collective action. At the same time as the internet developed in the same 1990s, as the internet developed, more of us were looking at the phenomena of free software, of later on became uh, 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 Wikipedia, uh, uh, to show that in fact, commons-based practices, practices that were not based on property, 
were not based on hierarchy, were successfully building core parts of the infrastructure of a substantial technological revolution, uh, one of the technological revolutions that were, were most significant over the course of, let's say, 150 years. When economists said this was impossible, there were these facts. So if in 1995, you stood up in a room of economists and said two groups of developers think that it's important to have a, this piece of software called the web server. One of them is Microsoft, and they think this is their core strategic next step to maintaining their monopoly. The other is a bunch of developers who sort of think they need one and should patch one together from what exists. And they run on a license where no one has exclusive control over the thing. No one is paid to contribute to it. Uh, directly, and no one is paid to manage the project. Which of the two over the next 20 uh, years through cycles of boom and bust would be dominant in the market? It would not have been a hard question. This is not a three months uh, 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 fashion phenomenon. I've been, I've been using versions of this since 2001. Then it was old because it was already six years of data. Um, this is Microsoft, the red. And it looks really scary now until you realize that this is one particular class of spammers using, uh, uh, using uh, uh, Microsoft uh, uh, web server. Once you actually look at highly active sites and at top million sites, you see that it none, the only, the only uh, new increase in this engines, with it, which is itself also uh, free and open source software. Not a passing phenomenon and nothing that someone who says I care about economics and efficiency can ignore when you're talking about one of the mission critical pieces of uh, software for all uh, web communications. And of course, we know it, uh, this has been true now for a variety of infrastructural uh, units. So that existence proof, the great weakness, perhaps strength, of the Ostrom School was that most of their studies were on the peripheries of world economies. So they were detailed. They were careful, and they were non-threatening to the orthodoxy of the time because they could be described as quaint. She was brilliant. She generalized and created a set of general categories that then forced themselves onto other areas as they established themselves in these safe peripheries. This you can't assign to the periphery. This is it. You can't talk about the thing that develops the internet, the thing that companies adopt uh, uh, for their next uh, uh, platform for strategy, et cetera, as peripheral. And then we also saw that it turns out that uh, this is a pretty good business model. Um, uh, you go around, you sell 32 volumes for several thousand dollars. In the late 90s, the leading information economy said everything is going to change. Encarta is going to kill Britannica. Mm -hmm. because it's got the network effect, it communicates with the, uh, it gets distributed, etc. And indeed, Britannica came down to $500 CDs in the late 90s. Eventually, uh, 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 it didn't turn out to be in Carta. Uh, that one went out of business in 2009. Um, uh, instead, we all know exactly what it is. This mass hallucination. And again, I, the first time I actually studied Wikipedia was the summer of 2001, when it was about four or five months old. Um, to stand up and say, this thing could work. 900 stubs on a platform that no one owns, no one gets paid to pay or uh, to, to write or edit. And there are lots of Wikipedias that failed, or encyclopedias that failed. But you can't ignore one of the top sites in the world that becomes a core uh, knowledge utility against all of our assumptions. <coughs> Over the years, I've put this into a, let's call it, 20th to 21st century framework. And the way to think about it, in my, uh, in, in, in my view, is what we saw in the first half of the 20th century, or the first two thirds of the 20th century, was a continuous effort to systematize and rationalize systems. Both non-market systems moving away from family uh, uh, and, and local informal community uh, uh, collective action as the source of, of, of social security uh, to more government-based programs. Uh, and, uh, and in business, from the second industrial divide essentially creating the large-scale commercial organization, 
Uh, this is what we go all the way from Weber and Schumpeter through uh, Williamson. Um, and the idea is essentially these systems are too large to manage. As we already saw earlier, what happens in the 80s and 90s is that everyone is worried about failure. Everyone is worried about failure, and the theory that presents itself as the alternative <coughs> is neoliberalism, as I've just described. Because it turns out that this is not actually a solution to complexity and uncertainty. This actually successfully fails in all sorts of ways. And so there's an experimentation of moving, privatizing fun uh, uh, functions, uh, more uh, 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 rationality-based explanations of the family and mutual obligation and trust, uh, and, and large conglomerates like ITT end up being broken up and creating internal markets um, uh, as well. What we saw with the emergence of the realization of open innovation, commons, etc., was that initially out here in the periphery, all sorts of weirdos. That is to say, that weird tribe of, of um, uh, software uh, developers. Um, and then later on elsewhere, this became a solution space of integrating market and non-market, decentralized and centralized, as a solution space to a wide classes of problems. So if the core here in, in the past was free software and Wikipedia uh, uh, and a variety of other uh, uh, projects, um, we began to see as early as 2000 IBM contributing 500 patents to the Free Software Foundation and uh, uh, creating a, a services-oriented business based on a commons in the actual software development. Uh, we saw government organizations trying to uh, 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 harness citizen innovation in various ways in order to improve their services. And we saw a lot of small startups building their businesses and competing with existing businesses by becoming platforms for users to share, for example, their, their uh, trip reviews, their, their, uh, uh, their views on the world, um, uh, etc. What we've seen in the last three or four years is that these same economics that enable market decentralized firms to leverage non-material interests of people into business models are now beginning to also create fully decentralized on-demand markets. For the same transaction cost economics uh, reasons, they become more efficient perhaps than older larger organizations, but the meaning becomes completely different. In fact, what we are now is at a moment of clash. Because as long as, long as the primary market, small market players uh, are operating in the market space on social production were oriented towards allowing people to communicate and build things together and share them between each other, rather than as a mechanism for on-demand labor, uh, what we were looking at overall was a socialization of market relations and state relations. Instead, what we're seeing now is the use of some of the same technological changes in transaction cost economics to create market relations ever deeper into areas that in the past may have been governed by some combination of the more stabilizing effect of larger firms, the more stabilizing effect of social interactions and social relations, and instead creating arm's length repeat bargaining as a core model of uh, production. So that if you look at Galaxy Zoo, which is a platform that allows people to tag and understand maps of stars, and at Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a platform that allows tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people to uh, uh, give small jobs that allow people to interact, Technically, many of the tasks are exactly the same. The social meaning of the interaction is completely different. If there is an example of alienated labor, it is the state of the Turker who does not know, cannot know, cannot get to know and understand the person giving the job and uh, the money. And yet, there it is. So there's a real battle between the so-called sharing economy, what is the on-demand economy, and, um, um, uh, and peer production. 
uh, over the meaning of what it means to interact. And what changes here is not the technology. What changes here is the social meaning and the embeddedness of the social market or non-market exchange. Some of the places where this is clearest are some of the best known uh, companies. So if you look at Couchsurfing, which long preceded Airbnb, uh, it was a certain, certain idea where you, have to, you come, you stay with people's homes, you share something, you participate, you respect differences, you're neat, you do not pay was one of the core votes. Airbnb, nice place to pay. The excitement that I started reading with people reading, excited about the sharing economy, about Uber, drove me crazy for the simple reason that when I wrote Sharing Nicely in 2004, one of the baffling things was the fact that the second most common commuting to work mode of transportation in the United States is carpooling. Not for money, with neighbors and coworkers. Bigger than all other modes of public transportation put together, though obviously everything dwarfed by, by, dwarfed by single uh, occupant vehicles. That was a shared economy. This is an on-demand economy. And the idea is that now we're battling over the meaning of what it means to share. It's not crazy for people who conceive of themselves as consumers to imagine that by renting a car by the hour, they are sharing the resource of the car instead of owning a car that sits in their garage. It's not crazy. But the actual production activity is as far from sharing as could be. Unsurprisingly, Zipcar ends up getting sold to, um, uh, which was really the first uh, 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 crude version, ends up being sold to Avis. The other major threat that has fallen out of some of the applications of market utilization of social relations in production has been the surveillance capitalism uh, model, where the big SIP, big data surveillance informed behavior uh, uh, because that, what starts out being interpreted as leveraging and enabling social interaction for free becomes very much of a combination of several things. And this is, I'm basically applying to the economy something that Zeynep Tufekci wrote, I think, beautifully in First Monday on how it applies to politics. Ubiquitous computing means that all of us carry a surveillance device on us all of the time. Um, Big data means we now have the capacity to collect all this data and make it into meaningful uh, uh, knowledge. The behavioral turn, which has nothing to do with technology, where we've seen initially from psychology, then it gets the boost from being integrated into economics uh, and, and the Nobel Prizes for Tversky and Kahneman. Um, uh, the idea that people are programmable and predictable, that, that self-interested rationality is no longer a good model because people are in fact as predictable as rational actors are, but they're not rational. They're susceptible to various behavioral interventions, uh, has cut, cut across, particularly in economics, incredibly powerful. Real-time experimentation and implementation in platforms mean that companies that own these platforms can run experiments on millions of people at the same time and then extract from that what populations will do, but also what individuals can do, because they can experiment on individuals. Um, my dear colleague, Cass Sunstein's work on nudge, and the idea, how could you disagree with the idea that if people, if the default is flipped to save for retirement, people save to retirement, and if the default is flipped for, to, you have to choose to save to retirement, people save less. How could you disagree that it's good to set the default one way or the other. The practical effect is a legitimation of the behavioral turn as a legitimate way of now we're just or arguing about the legitimacy of the goals. We're no longer arguing about the legitimacy of treating an individual as an object for uh, behavioral manipulation because the state of the world is people are behavioral. The state of the world is there are defaults. We have no choice but to treat people as potentially programmable actors. Um, and so Facebook experiments showed that people's streams uh, 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 influence 
uh, their, their emotions. If you have happy versus sad messages, you begin to produce more happy and sad messages. Uh, um, uh, there was a recent study that Google actually search location influences, uh, search result location influences people's preferences for political candidates. Most of the research has been spooky about uh, uh, politics. But fundamentally, this breaks down the whole idea of a market responding to demand. Demand is not anything. We know this already from advertising that demand can be managed. But when you can experiment at the individual level about which manipulation will cause you to want which things, or at least want in an actionable way uh, uh, certain things, the whole idea that you have demand separated from supply, that market actually do anything, that there is a coherent idea of welfare that markets supply, where welfare is that which I want given the conditions that have been set for me experimentally with an understanding that's behavioral of me, is incoherent. That's a challenge to the future of capitalism. Um, what's fascinating, I, come, I love this, this, this tool. Uh, it's incredibly manipulable and non-scientific. Can I just admit this? Um, actually, it's really important that I admit this. It's incredibly manipulable and non-scientific. Uh, how you set the search string, how you set your period, how you set the smoothing has massive influence. It's not pure bullshit, but it is very, very interesting. Um, look at what happened to the public good and the commons in the last 20 years. To an extent, the idea of the commons is coming to fill some of the same roles that we used to use with the idea of the public good. Completely, not absolutely, these are confounded terms, but there's been a systematic increase. There's a first bump, as Garrett Hardin argues about the tragedy of the commons, and people argue about the tragedy of the commons. And then there's Lynn Ostrom's tragedy of the commons, and the internet commons beginning to develop, both of them rising consistently. As our concern, as our comfort with using the public good as a shared ideal, begins to decline. I don't stand a chance of a snowball in hell of finishing it at this rate uh, in an hour. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll just have to decide how we, how we play this out. Um, so let me try to explain how the commons respond to the challenge of neoliberalism and in what way they're different from the public good. It's really important in both. The first is the study of common property regimes, the Ostrom School, um, studies these common property regimes. Um, they develop a, a system of analysis called institutional analysis and development, which essentially says local resource systems are an, an outcome of institutions, social relations, the particular characteristics of the resource, and together, local communities over time build uh, stable resource management systems. Um, critically, they focus on local knowledge and effective self -help. Information commons and open access, by contrast, talks about open access and public domain for anyone to use, not just for local communities. It can be growth-oriented. It's not unlike the third, the global commons in the environmental movement. It's about stewardship. It's very much about growth. Highways, canals, um, uh, all of this, were, uh, uh, all of these things begin as co uh, begin as private toll roads, for example, but end up going into commons. Infrastructure becomes commons, and it's not unlike common studies uh, uh, in the Austrian school at the periphery, but at the core. We talked about it today. So, how do these relate to the pillars of neoliberalism? The core insight of institutional analysis and development is that complexity and uncertainty are not solved by property-based rules based on incentives uh, for self-interest. They are sometimes exacerbated by those. That in the effort to simplify the claims into property rules, interventions muck up. Instead, what we have is that continuously locally-based knowledge, based on continuous sensing, based on social relations uh, and cultural habits, those are the ones that adapt to the truly local conditions. 
Those are the ones that convey truly rich information about the interaction in the place, and those are the ones that work. And when you try to introduce a property-based solution based on self-interested rationality and let's limit into those settings, they collapse rather than uh, 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 flush. Um, in the information commons, uh, the critical thing that was important to us in this movement was that innovation and creativity, the more uncertain the situation is, the faster moving the situation is, the more innovation and creativity primarily needs freedom to operate and only secondarily the power to appropriate. So one way in which I try visually to, to express this is if you imagine that the resource space of who knows what goes from very routine to very creative. Uh, and, the re and, and, and the project space, what should we do, goes from predictable to diverse and certain and complex. Um, and the fixed cost of capital, of being able to be effective, goes from very high and concentrated to relatively low and distributed. That's where we are when in the, uh, this is essentially in, uh, on the capital side, this is where we are in the network information economy, where for the first time so really since the industrial resolution, revolution, the most important inputs into the core economic activities of the most advanced economies are widely distributed in the population. Computers in every pocket, sensors, etc. The more the more you're down here, the more you can operate on optimization, on, on, on uh, focus on clearly identified incentives, you know exactly what you want and exactly uh, how, how much to pay for it. The more you're out here, you're looking at exploration and experimentation, at freedom to operate, at diverse motivation, simply because it's very hard to measure how creative someone was at 11.45 a.m. on a Tuesday morning. And so we have the system that we have here, for example, where if you think of Bertonian science up there, this is essentially where we sit um, uh, in this building. The idea that there are certain far out enough things we need to learn and understand, that if we were to try to convert them and translate them into discrete payment, discrete motivation, we would essentially completely miss what's important. And so we create a variety of institutions some very core to the close, like managerial hierarchies, where, optimism, where we know what we want, more or less, we know who knows, or, or at least it's fungible, and we can have a managed hierarchy. Amazon Mechanical Turk and crowdsourcing is like that. As we move further away, out of the known and into the unknown, commons-based practices become much more important. Practices that, if not commons-based, at least based on social norms, are social norms of open uh, publication and engagement and separation of material incentives from uh, 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 performance, but rather the use of diverse motivations. Some can be quite, uh, this is not about, oh, this is all nice and that is all bad. The status seeking anyone? I, I believe we're, we're, we're an organization that for a millennium has been uh, uh, operating uh, on, on a status-based uh, 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 economy. It's not a nice versus not nice. It's commercial, specifically economic, versus other motivations that are uh, more oriented on the social. So that's with regard to uncertainty and complexity. In fact, it's not about deregulation. It's not about property-based and self-interested. You need diverse motivations. Uh, sorry. You need diverse motivations. You need. Uh, freedom to operate, you need the freedom to be to, to explore, and those require commons and social models of organization rather than freeing markets from social interactions. Um, I'm gonna skip now over a whole bunch of things because I want to make sure we have time for a conversation. Uh, so I will capture them in a minute or so and then skim through things that are more detailed, and I'll be happy to come back to them later. Um, the core target of the Ostrom School was, uh, uh, was, was Munzer Olson's um, um, logic of collective action. The idea that when you got people together, their divergent interests would lead them necessarily to collapse and be captured in one form or another. And what that school of thought showed over and over again 
was that that was simply empirically false. People were able to come together with systems of combined, some oversight, some formal models, some informal models, um, uh, um, some were more religious, uh, like the Bali irrigation systems, others were more uh, long-term familial uh, relations, but people were able to solve their collective action problems through a diverse set of nested institutions rather than through uh, 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 explicit uh, characterization of property rights and market exchange. Um, one of the things that's been enormously productive for uh, me and for many of my, my graduate students um, has been the fact that as the knowledge commons, as the internet commons becomes a mode of living, it's a fascinating thing to start to look at because people do things and the fossil record of their activities is there because everything they do is in communication. And so Wikipedia in particular, there are today two conferences largely devoted to people studying Wikipedia. You've got 100,000 people out in the open doing the impossible and continuing to live it. And it's there. So there's enormous, enormous uh, uh, data now coming out of these about how people actually manage and govern their relationships. I saw you had um, uh, um, this piece here, Practical Anarchism. Uh, here. The details of what I'm about to say are in this piece, so if you're interested uh, in it, what I tried to do is extract from other people's studies a, system, a systematic set of elements that go into the effective governance of knowledge commons and information commons. There's a group of people uh, uh, put together in many senses by, not in many senses, put together really by, by, by um, uh, Brett Frischman, uh, Michael Madison, and Catherine Strandberg. Uh, who re explicitly take the Austro model for studying local commons and apply it to online cultural commons. Very, very interesting uh, uh, studies. Uh, but we have increasing information. And now, let me run through and just give you the, over the, the, uh, the overview of all the details. Um, essentially, we have a law, commons-based licensing. Licensing that leverages the law in an act of jujitsu uh, to uh, uh, force openness. Essentially, there's a property law intended to create property that is then licensed on a model that keeps things open. The critical point here is that one of the things that falls out of the uh, 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 study, the experimental study of cooperation, is that we're not always. There are consistently in every randomly selected group of people, some people, who will in fact behave fairly reliably according to the traditional rational act or self-interested model. Maybe on the order of 30%. And there are people who will systematically behave in the model of true altruists. Maybe 10%. And there's a massive middle of people who, generally speaking, will reciprocate, generally speaking, will respond to social norms and social cues, and most importantly, and I'm sort of bringing something from later in the, in, the, in the talk now, most importantly, will be influenced by the situation and the frame. My favorite story on this is uh, 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 an experiment called the Wall Street uh, uh, game, where essentially two groups Students in the US, pilots in Israel, uh, were run through a series of standard prisoner's dilemmas games. And they were randomly selected. One group was told they were playing the cooperation game. The other group, they were playing the Wall Street game. Those, and it's exactly the same. Those who were told they were playing the Wall Street game, 70% started out defecting, not cooperating. And very quickly, over the course of several rounds, uh, cooperation diminished to zero. Those who were told they were playing the cooperation game, 70% started out cooperating and maintained cooperation throughout the seven rounds of the game. We are not fixed. We are capable of both. And we respond to the situation we're in. Which means that when you live under an ideology for 40 years that tells you you're playing the Wall Street game, the majority of people will play the Wall Street game. And the result is the one we've seen. 
So, common space licensing, people have rough consensus uh, and debate. There's both a sense that it's better than just straight voting. Voting is not enough, you have to persuade. But at the same time, you have to show that the thing works. You can't just insist on your uh, uh, theoretical belief. Very strong emphasis on meritocracy and the idea that it's not accreditation that matters, but what you can do and how you can contribute. Very strong sense of redundant, nested spheres of power. I do this particular thing, so even though you're the grand poobah over there, in this particular thing, you need to listen to me. And you need to listen to us doing this over here. Uh, formal institutions do play a role, but one of the most amazing things is irreverence and resistance are continuous everywhere, and all leaders are always reminded, no matter if in the local nested or, up, uh, or, or Jimmy Wales up at the top, uh, not to call it the top of Wikipedia, it's idiotic, uh, or Jimmy Wales at the foundation of Wikipedia um, is, uh, 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 is always cut down to size. Very important because it's a habit of mind. Irreverence and resistance as core characteristics of good citizenship is, I think, one of the things we need to take. We talked about the, the, uh, the intellectual arc of rationality as self-interest, essentially across multiple, multiple uh, areas of study. A better model of, uh, and this is really in the Penguin and the Leviathan in the second book much more than in the first, a core understanding is that essentially, yes, we have material interests. Ignoring them and thinking that we don't operate on them to some extent, however we define ourselves, ourselves, our family, uh, uh, our broader uh, uh, community. Uh, material interests matter, but so do moral commitments. People effectively move from what they sacrifice their self-interest, uh, uh, social motivations and connections, emotional needs and effective responses, all of these operate together. You might think of them as, as vectors of force that are pushing you in different directions. And ultimately, there's a sum. Um, I told you the story of the Wall Street uh, versus community game. The centrality of the frame of the situation falls on all of these studies. All It matters how we think of our interaction. And uh, crowding out or misalignment is a major challenge. If you go to dinner, and instead of bringing flowers or chocolate, you put a check on the table at the end of a meal. You're not going to increase the probability you're going to be invited again to a friendly dinner. Money in interactions matters. It changes the meal. We're back to Uber versus uh, Yelp. Even they're both commercial, though they're both commercial uh, settings. What we've seen really in the last 15 years is a move from the dominance of homo economicus and self-interest with guile as the core mechanism design to homo socialis, diverse social, pro-social motivations and susceptibility to design, and from an idea that the way you can run an organization is through competition and control to one that focuses on cooperation, normativity, and self-direction has become very good. We talked already about the property-based incentives, so I won't go into this. Um, here's the 20-word version of this, and I'm happy to go back into it if people want to later on in the conversation. I tried to map. We have this idea that somehow there's government, market, and social. In fact, if you try to map governance models and provisioning models, we see that our society is pervaded both by asymmetric, that is to say, this is mine, not yours, I get to decide. And symmetric, we both come to the park and have a party. And you can have your party over there and I'll have my party over here. And if I'm first, I'll use it first today. And if you're first tomorrow, you'll use it tomorrow. We have commons and property, exclusion and non-exclusive side by side throughout society, whether the provisioning is done by the state, by the market, by the social, or by nature, and whether the actual governance of how, how things work is state regulation, property and contract, social cultural norms, or no constraint at all. All of these operate and intersect, and a modern economy is not made of property and leftover, markets and leftover. It's not made of just property and markets and just state regulation. 
It's made of all of these things together, and things that were, that, that were very commonly, uh, so, so peer review of science uh, studies, to call that government regulation is a mistake. No one would call it uh, uh, economic uh, marketing, but it is social cultural norms of governance with state provision. Um, only very small things like hot dogs, homes, personal uh, computers, etc., really are produced by markets and governed by property and contract. Lots and lots of things, but not everything. Um, the critical thing is that a lot of the things we're talking about, and the reason that commons have become so important, is because a lot of the activities that were literally considered impossible by the mainstream of economics 20 years ago occupy this space here. Free software, Wikipedia, etc. This this space of uh, 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 of socially provisioned goods that are governed either by property and contract or by social norms, um, uh, and that's what we that's really the phenomenon that's developed. Um, what's less significant in the uh, 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 in the Ostrom School and more significant in both the commons and the environment, in, in both the information commons and the environmental movement uh, idea of commons, is the rejection of the idea that free means free market. And this has to do very much with the fact for us in the information commons world, with the fact that information has always been extremely difficult for economists to live with. It is a really quirky economic good. In fact, it's not. It's what's called, even in economics, an explicit public good. Um, but it is at the center of what's uh, uh, most valuable now. So at the core of the economy, the thing that's always been the exception is the exception. Like all the First Amendment scholars always drive me crazy when they focus on handbills and newspapers and door-to-door um, uh, and, and -door, uh, knocking. And then they have this last chapter at the end of the book for the exceptions, um, um, telephone, radio, television, cable, and internet. Um, um, and of course, with the environmental con So the, the repeated existence of monopolies, of market failures, of the impossibility of perfect information show up here over and over again. And the idea is essentially not that markets don't matter, this is critical, but that markets are systematically imperfect, imperfect and systematically corruptible, and fail and succeed and fail and succeed and go through cycles of, of creation of power, destruction, creation, destruction, but never actually efficient, never actually providing free uh, uh, action, only changing patterns of power and control. So um, limits and tensions. Ten years ago, it was a lot easier for me to sit and talk about free software and Wikipedia as potential models for the future. Um, a lot of things haven't actually uh, scaled. Diaspora tried to be a social network instead of Facebook. Did not catch. Community networks since the early 90s, since the mid 90s, people were talking about community networks. All the regulatory uh, barriers have been taken off. The efforts have not taken over. Instead, we see Xfinity Wi-Fi or BT Open Zone. Um, so does mutualism scale within the state? Both the Ostrom School and the Information Commons and, 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 and uh, Internet Commons schools really in some sense see the state as too slow, too overbearing, uh, a strong libertarian streak um, uh, in both of them. But at the end of the day, they're a core things that the state needs to do. How do we interact with the state? What is the role of the state? What hybrid forms are there? And now, really, the question of the last two or three years is, is the market returning with a vengeance? The two things that I spoke about, the on-demand economy and uh, free services and uh, uh, data translating into big SIP capitalism. Um, so let me conclude here with a, a framing of the mid and high-level ideas of the commons. At a mid-level, the core ideas are people can effectively act collectively to govern their utilization of resources. We respond to diverse motivations, economic utility, and a range of social motivations uh, uh, and rational ethical commitments. 
property and markets versus state planning does not exhaust the range of options. We, in fact, do and can continue even more to have much more discourse-specific local uh, interactions uh, uh, that allow us environmental risk action in commons can also support growth, be more efficient, but also be more free in the sense of destabilizing power uh, than others. At the higher level, one of the things that's critical is that production and resource management are socially embedded activities. Social embeddedness is not something from which we need to free markets, but rather we need to re-embed production in social relations. Freedom needs to be understood as effective self-governance, irrespective of the source of constraint. It doesn't matter whether it's market or the state, but at the end of the day, you are either constrained knowing it or manipulated not knowing it. Um, and where markets disembed production, they can do more harm than good. Um, well, how, how's people's uh, energy level? Another 10 minutes, or, or shall we sort of stop and talk? No, go a few more minutes. Okay. Um, what do we do and how do we connect these things together? Um, I'm going to propose three things. The first is uh, really in this piece, in practical anarchism. Um, we need to build as much as feasible of the economy on a model of peer cooperatism. There is no technical reason. There's no economic reason. There's no sociological reason why Uber couldn't be owned by its drivers and developers rather than by its VCs and its entrepreneurs. It won't and can't happen in the economy as a whole. But if we see 10 to 15% of companies or enterprises shift to becoming social enterprises, that could make a big impact. We need to shift the social understanding of what appropriate management in government, in, in companies is, so that we socially embed market behavior as well and take from the commons study and take from that moment of the study of human motivation and the study of the commons, the feasibility of um, um, high commitment, high performance organizations as a core model so that we change the interactions of most people who remain in more traditional market ownership models. And we need to reimagine our interaction as citizens with governments. And I'll skim very quickly over these three, but these are the three. Uh, so the, the core of free software was, we're going to build our own. So we don't have to depend on you when you exercise power through your system. That's the core ethic. This is what TCP, IP, HTML, free software, Wikipedia, Wi-Fi, like, all show that it's not a pipe dream. But like I said, diaspora, community wireless, the fact that Firefox uh, earlier last year was forced by consumer uh, need to implement uh, digital rights management, all of these show that this is not a panacea. But there's a difference between not a panacea and impossible. We don't need the whole market. We just need parts of it. So you're beginning to see things like Amara uh, that, is, uh, that starts out as a volunteer platform for subtitling um, uh, video for all sorts of languages, turning into something that allows paid companies that want uh, 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 training videos, et cetera, uh, to be translated, and beginning to struggle now with how they manage a volunteer community that also becomes a paid work community, but done by people coming out of the Participatory Culture Foundation with a very strong commitment, first and foremost, to preserving the volunteer social enterprise model, even as they say, look, we've got a lot of people sitting in the Philippines able to do translation. It would be good work for them. How do we create governance structures, sharing structures uh, 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 for how they work? Um, there's this concept, I don't think it's really been adopted, concept, Lazuz, uh, uh, that's anchored in Israel, which basically has the same idea of carpooling and Uber smashed into one, but also with a currency uh, underlying it using blockchain, which is the basis for Bitcoin. The idea essentially is to create an organization that from the bottom up, all the contracts, all the relations, all the currency, all the exchange, from the developers to the drivers is a single cooperative unit. 
They haven't really launched. I don't know if it's true. This is more of a sketch. And let's put it this way. Maybe in 15 years, I'll say, I looked at Lazus before they even launched the way that I say now about Wikipedia. Or maybe it'll be like everything2.com that I also talked about in two seconds. Uh, we'll see. Um, high commitment, high performance organization became a really powerful move within uh, uh, management uh, sciences. Uh, managerial and owner norms are important, and there's enough slack in the market for moral commitments to make a difference. This is the big battle between Marx and Proudhon, where Proudhon basically says we have to own it so that we can, uh, we, the workers, have to own it so that we can um, 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 uh, maintain and share. And Marx basically says the owner is as much trapped in the market as the worker because they're price takers. Very classical view of economics. Basically, there is no choice. Um, the point is markets are actually sufficiently inefficient that there is a lot of room for moral choice. So if you look at uh, Gore, 10,000 associates, ownership, no managers, <coughs> no boss relationship. 10,000 people, high tech company, multinational, uh, managing themselves in a lattice organization where people essentially create teams for projects, persuade other people to join them, work. They're the boss here. They are contributors there. It's not impossible, though it's a rare enough species that it needs to be studied. If you think, here we are sitting in, in Massachusetts, if you think of what was the victory of the market basket workers, it was the victory between two bosses, one who wanted to sell in the shareholder value model, and the other who had a human relations model. That was the choice. That was the great victory. Thankfully, now they're also making more money than they were uh, in the past. So it can also be said in a business school, not only uh, here. Um, and finally, there's what uh, uh, Stephen Johnson tried to identify as pure progressivism. I'm not sure it's the best name, but it's, it's a name for now. Um, and the idea that we build our own conception of citizenship on both the skepticism that the commons movement brought that doesn't imagine like old style progressivism that at the end of the day, rational state organization could work all the way down. Understands the limitations, understands the fallibility of the state, but at the same time understands the necessity of the state when we're looking at things like redistribution, when we're looking at things like classic public goods, when we're looking at things like spreading risk of economic insecurity uh, uh, throughout the population. It does require hey, I got 51 votes, I get to win as the end of the argument as opposed to continuing. Yes, it might resolve it sometimes, but it's always a continuing argument. It does require that we be more engaged. It's taxing to be a member of the commons. It's not something you do every four years. It requires continuous social mobilization and engagement through networks of communication. It does require, as we have in our federal system, as you see with subsidiarity in Europe, but an even more thorough understanding that nested powers, power sources need to be nested, redundant at multiple levels, and you need to move back and forth, not based on a procedural battle. You as an individual participant, but based on what we understand to be things that we can argue about in terms of how things will work out. Uh, and we need redundant pathway to avoid, to invoke and avoid governance. This is a very uncomfortable political theory. It's a very uncomfortable political theory because it essentially, A, refuses to accept authority as final, refuses to accept a lazy citizenry as a given. Uh, it may not work. It's more utopian, perhaps, than many of the other things, though the other things seem more utopian than this. But I think this needs to be our goal. Um, as I said, the progressivism needs to be aware of the fallibility of the state. Um, a lot needs to be focused on destabilizing power. Power re-aggregates. 15 years ago, Google was the little entrant that could. It was our ally on everything. That's not true anymore. There are long-standing alliances, there are long-standing friendships, there are personal students of mine in all sorts of places. Uh, um, uh, and I think their ethical commitments matter. 
the fact that they're there, not somebody else, who understands the ethical implications of the choices they're making, it may make a difference. There may, there, just like there's a difference between uh, uh, which of the authors it is in Market Basket, there's a difference which company it is and who's where at that company. It's not irrelevant. But alliances change and moral commitments about how human beings ought to interact with each other need to dominate our sense of um, uh, this company or that, or whether it's market or the state. Redistribution from the top, I don't see how we do without the state. Um, and I think it's really important to understand, this is where I started, oligarchy is prevalent. We see it in the US today, it's particularly easy because of the problem of, of money in politics, but it's not the only. Aggregations of money that are very large will use all of these systems to increase their control. We see it in anywhere from the, the uh, relationship between wealth and college admission that begins to turn uh, wealth into merit uh, through to uh, tax reform uh, and its resistances. It's there. The power aggregation is too great to ignore the state and say we'll build around it. It's not enough. Um, and vigilance against capture. Uh, And this is all sorts of this stuff. Um, uh, details. Um, let me stop here. I'd love to hear thoughts and continue the conversation, go back to anything, talk about other things that other people are raising. Um, but thank you.